Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm in Sherman Oaks, California. We're with Linda Perry. It's great to see you. Hello, Mitch. Thank Thanks you for, for taking time to sit down with us. Well, of course. So we are in a, I, I just love this facility that, that is your, your studio and yep. it also houses your label and your publishing company. Well, actually, no, this is just my studio okay. and I have, um, we have another office in Studio City where it's our... It's our We Are Here office. Downstairs, it's uh, a retail store. We sell records, merchandise. We'll have a uh, a stage for kids to come and do songwriter showcases. We'll have a little um, recording studio so we can send kids home with, you know, demos of a song they wrote. And the idea of We Are Here is to bring community and definitely focusing on kids Right. And letting them meet other kids, you know, and while listening to records, get a, a grab a bite to eat, and then upstairs will be our office. But this is my studio only. It is beautiful. Thank you very so much. So many great instruments. And we were talking earlier about mm -hmm. the, the hybrid Neve and API console, yep. which is so cool. Yeah, it's really, this is a 1604. Beck has the sister. Okay. So there's there's twins. This is one, and Beck has the other one. Nice. And... um. My little sidecar over there, my Neve sidecar, is obviously amazing, and it's, you know, um, you know, the, it's really nice with the knees because it has all that fat, low end richness, and the API has a bite to it. Um, but the 1604 is pretty fat sounding, so it's a really nice combination when doing, you know, I, you know, I record everything live, did all Dolly's record out here just live and. It's just got a really cool old um, school sound. Right, right. Yeah. So you really are the uh, the scope of things that you're touching from songwriting to production to publishing to management to artist development. I mean, you're really engineering. We were talking about earlier mm -hmm. producing. I mean, it really is a broad web of things that you're working on. Um, yeah, I'm not working on them. It's just what I do. So like sometimes it's interesting because it's hard to. I, you know, without the metaphor, I do wear a lot of hats in, in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been like that and, and and always have worn hats. Um, but I just feel uh, I'm really good with a lot of stuff hitting me. I don't know why, but I'm, I'm really good at just put, being under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I need it for my creative. I need it for my soul. Um, it helps me not think, and I don't like to think much. So <laughs> whatever I can do, like I don't sleep a lot, but I'll just like, I just keep. I'm like a machine. I'm like a little little ball of machinery that's just rolling along, and just, you know, I just have a lot of dreams, and I have a lot of things. There's a lot of things for us to do. Right. You know, right. when we're in these positions, as you and I are, you know, to be able to reach out to people, it is our duty to speak up and say something and give kids the right information. So um, that's why I was so happy to have you guys here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're happy to be here as well. And that, that's so cool. I mean, the way we first kind of connected was through your artist, Dorothy, mm -hmm. who was out at Sweetwater and we did an interview and the band played and, and uh, did some, some great stuff there. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you, how do you find artists? What would make an artist appeal to you? And, and what's kind of the process for them? Well, with Dorothy, for instance, um, Rock Nation approached me to produce her record, and I felt like, I don't know, I don't, I don't mean to be an a-hole, but I felt like the team wasn't right. So I said, you know, I can deliver you guys rumors, and it's not going to do anything because the team isn't good. Mm -hmm. So it felt like a waste of my time because, you know, things like that happen. You know, you... There's really talented artists out there, but if the team is not right, you just it just doesn't happen. It's just right. that's just the way it is. So I um, got my partner Carrie Brown. I said, let's go in there and make them an offer. Like we'll take her, we'll do a JV with her, you know, with them, and we'll go make her a star, and they can take all the credit. We basically got laughed at, you know, by Jay Brown, and then a week later, she fired her manager. They circled back around, said, why don't you manage her? Because they knew they needed us. Right. Um, and we were like, well, that makes sense. You know, and so we started, that's how we got into managing is starting with her. Mm -hmm. And she's extremely talented. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. amazing. Yeah. 
and a, and a fresh approach to what's such a cool arena to step into. Right, and that yeah. voice and her person. I mean, she's a Dorothy's a rock star. I don't see a lot of rock stars out there, but when you see her, she, you just know you're meeting a rock star. That is a rock star. Right. Right. It's interesting to me looking back on your career and all the things that you've done. It seems like you have that vision, like you recognize opportunities or recognize it's time to make a change or recognize something new. Is that come easily to you? Do you just see these things? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a perfect example. Maybe not a perfect example. I'll give you an example. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I'm used to that. <laughs> so, for, for, for example, uh, Four Non Blondes. You did the first album, second album you were working on, oh, gotcha. but you made the decision not to mm -hmm. move forward, which that's a tough decision to yeah. make. Uh, yeah. My life has been a series of just running on my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a good thing. But it has definitely got me from here to there. And I don't know what would have happened if I actually followed the rules and did the things that I was supposed to do or or so I you think you're supposed to do. But I don't really look at that. I just know that for me, I got in this band and it wasn't really the experience that I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. We were great. Everything was awesome. But it just, I needed more. Mm -hmm. And so I took a risk. I jumped out and to go find myself, to find that more. Right. And then I fell into being a songwriter, producer. And that made a lot of sense to me. I was like, oh, because I had a lot. Like I wanted to write country songs, R&B songs, but band kept on like, well, this is not for non blondes. You know, like I was too, too all over the place. Right. I have a lot of influences. I want to write Brazilian music and in all of it. Um, so it made total sense when I became a producer and a songwriter. I was like, I can dabble all over the world. I can I can go to all kinds of genres of music and and experiment and and have fun and and not be held back because it doesn't. It's not our sound. Right. Right. Yeah, and you've made a number of it. That was just one example. You've made a number of it, seems to me, again, you know, the choice not to necessarily go out on the road as much and to be more in the studio mm -hmm. and to choose different artists to write with and to uh, to uh, to work with. Um, and I think a lot of artists struggle with that, right? Because those are hard decisions to make. Well, I'm very decisive. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, again, these are my decisions. And at the end of the day, you don't really know if you're making the right decision. You just got to stand by them. Right. So no matter what I say right now, I did really great. I made really great choices. Right. <laughs> it worked out perfectly. I have to believe that, you right. know what I mean? Because right. otherwise I'm going to be all, should I have done that? Or, you know, then who wants to live there? We don't want to, I don't want to be in regret, you know? Right. So I don't live there. So I just do what feels right for me to do. Okay. It's felt right for me to be a producer, songwriter. Felt right for me to um, start a label. Felt right for me to sign James Blunt, this little squirrely kid that nobody wanted. I signed him, sold 12 million records when nobody was selling records. Um, I'm going to go be mom, you know. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I'll i close that um, company and start a new one with my new partner, Carrie Brown, and now we're going to be a publishing. So I just kind of just keep doing things that just feel right for me to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm having fun. But I'm not either because the more I want and the more I'm capable of doing, it means the longer it's going to take to just relax and kick back and enjoy the comforts of the things that we build. Right. And I'm just not in that position. I don't I don't know how to be content. So the process isn't the, the fun for you? No, it, it is fun. You know, Mitch, it's just sometimes I do go, when is it going to be enough? Right. Linda, when, you know, like when people like I want, I got a, inducted to the Songwriter Hall of Fame for a great example of me. What an incredible honor, right? Sure. No. The next day I felt like a loser. <laughs> I didn't know what I'm doing with my life. I have to strive higher. Like the more I get, the more I realize I need to work harder because I have to be worthy of these, these rewards that the universe is giving me. And I certainly can't take it the easy way. So I do tend to make life a little hard on myself because 
there's just so much to do. Like we were talking about, there's kids need us right now. Kids right. need us in the music business. So I can't rest right now. I got to sure. come up with, we're going to go do a festival, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, yeah. Like I said, there's always, there's always more to do, right? And you obviously you have set the bar high. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's all those, those things that go into that, but yeah, there's, there's, there's always fun stuff to do. The, uh, the other aspect of that is that you work with so many artists and it, it's interesting to me to, uh, to hear you and, and see interviews with you where you talk about how those are almost like therapy sessions and you bringing what you do to those artists. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you mentioned a number of big name artists who you, you have worked through those kind of things with. Yeah, I don't even know how that started. I think it's because I'm just so nosy. Um, and, you know, and I, I'm a, I read people really well. So it's not even on purpose. It's like if somebody comes into my studio... Um, I can just instantly pick up on something because I work, that's why I needed my own studio. I used to work with people and like would, you know, rent out, you know, this place or enterprise or Conway or whatever, but I, it, I didn't like the energy that was in the studio. So I had to spend a whole day cleansing the energy and you got to deal with all these other people. So I was like, I have to have my own studio and to control the atmosphere and the energy. And so so when somebody walks in and there's a, something going on, I just instantly, it's just my nature. So what's going on with you? What? Nothing. Something's going on. <laughs> just want you to know I'm here to talk. You know, that's part of writing music. So, I mean, this is a, uh, uh, an incredible opportunity that we're getting right now. Um, so whatever you're going through, there could be a possibility of you releasing it, you know, through song. It doesn't mean we have to let people hear this song, but maybe it's an opportunity for you to to dive a little deep and find out what's going on. So as soon as I open that door to make it feel safe, because when you come work with me, I, I create a safe environment. That's our job is to make you, I, I need to make you, Mitch, pour your heart out, you know, <laughs> and how am I going to do that? I can't do it by being abusive to you and yelling at you. Sure. So I have to make you feel comfortable and safe and like you can trust me. And um, so once we establish that trust with, honestly, literally we're talking three minutes. I say, how are you doing? And the, the tears, waterworks, we're going to Niagara Falls. And right. so, but what's really special about that is that, you know, the, whatever reason somebody's giving me this wonderful gift of sharing this very intimate emotional luggage that they've been carrying around right so i kind of got a name from it because every time i work with somebody they have a conversation with so and so and they tell tell sessions that they have with me and then I want to work with her. So that's kind of how I traveled around. I was called the song doctor for a little bit, you know, yeah, right, and right. <laughs> thought that was kind of funny, but um, right. I don't know. I don't, I'm not doing it because I'm great. I'm just doing it because it's what I do. Right. Sure. Sure. Write a song and get free therapy as part of the, the bundle. It's a bundle exactly. deal, right? Hey, you know what? And sometimes we don't even, we don't even get to the song. Sometimes I've had artists where we've just talked and then I realize where they want to be in their career is not, doesn't feel like I can connect there. And, um, and I'll have this wonderful conversation and then I'll just send them along their way. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I don't think we're meant to write together. I think maybe you're supposed to come here and we're supposed to talk. But wait a minute, I don't understand. I mean, I want to, we're, we're paying you to hang out with you. I don't want your money. We didn't do anything. You know, go give it to somebody else. But we, if, I'll take your money if you want me to right. write you a stupid song. Right. I'll take it. But do you really want that? And they're like, no. And then they're shocked how honest I am. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people, I'm not, you're not supposed to work with people. Maybe right. you're just supposed to talk to them and connect. Right, right. And just to be, to be clear for those who, who may not know, we're not talking about entry level artist necessarily but yeah. you're talking about major, major artists who, major that, artists, that insecurity yeah. as an artist doesn't uh, go away as you as you rise I, up the i think ladder. it gets worse you think so yeah because what happens is when we start out you know we're just writing songs right in our garage or bathroom or whatever we play some shows we get that instant feedback you know you got a little balls on you you're like no one's telling you what to do you're able to kind 
Okay, let me scratch that. Maybe that's not happening today anymore because I talk to kids and they don't know what a rehearsal room is. But back in my day, you know, we did do that stuff. And then you get signed and then you make your album, you go on tour. And then the insecurities start because now the very thing that you're so good at, apparently they don't want. You know, now they want you to change or this, that, you know, how many artists do we know that were great but until they got signed and then the label changed them. But why did, why did you sign them? Right. If they were so great, why are you changing them? Why are you changing the very core of them? You know? Um, and so the insecurities start mm-hmm. right there. Oh, the record company wants me to do this. Insecurity. Um God, we didn't get that radio station that wants to, that is, you know, that would put us in the top 10, whatever. Insecurity. Oh, we didn't sell out our show. Insecurity. I didn't get the Fallon show. Insecurity. Oh, we only sold 200,000 records. Insecurity. Insecurity just keeps piling on. And so by the time we get to our next record, where we're just supposed to be open-minded and in our power, we're not in our power anymore. Right. 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 You know, because you know why? Now the label wants us to go work with all these big fancy songwriters. Sure. Because you're not good enough. Right. Just adding on on top of everything else. Yeah. It's a pile yeah. of insecurity. Yeah. Interesting. So when you uh, go to write with an artist, you mentioned uh, Dolly Parton, and of course there's been a whole everybody from from Weezer to Pink and so many many great artists in between. Do you go in with specific songs in mind for them? Do you have ideas that you think this is going to be great for so and so, and I'm going to take this, or do you just show up and let it go? Mm-mm. I have no idea. I have tons of songs, but those are just tons of songs. So every time I work with, I don't know why, but I feel like it's cheating. You know, like if I pull out a song that I wrote, you know, whatever, I feel like it's oddly, it's cheating. Hmm. I have weird things, like I have OCD and stuff like that. Like I can't cut through the gas station if I'm going on a walk. You know how you can just cut through the gas station? I have to literally go all the way around. I understand. If I cut, I feel like I've cheated my walk and I have to go make it up somewhere. If I don't touch the yellow post at the end of Fryman Canyon, I feel like I didn't do the whole walk. You know, like weird stuff like that. Anyways, so no, I write from scratch because I've never met you before. We're going to do something spectacular, and I don't want to cheat me and the artist out of a, a out of a, a a great experience. Because what happens sometimes if we are pre um, we have premeditated songwriting already happening it means we just block to this really beautiful experience that could happen between two people who are connecting for the very first time. Mm -hmm. So I'm stopping that connection right off the top. So I do not believe in having songs written unless they, I meet them and then they leave. And then sometimes I get inspired. Okay. So after the artist will leave, then I'll come up with the song because I'm wearing your coat. Now I put on your shirt. I'm going to put on your Sweetwater shirt and I'm going to sit with you now and I'm going to now be inspired by, okay, what, this is what I got from Mitch. And then I'll start writing a song and then I'll send it to them and say, Hey, after you left, I wrote this idea. Cause I know now for, for a fact, I wrote that song for that person. Right. Like I can't write a song for Madonna and hand it over to Alicia Keys Mm -hmm. like that. Like, I don't know why, but I just can't do it. It feels like I'm cheating. Right. I'm a weirdo like that. (laughs) Like, weirdo. Yeah. That's part of the process, though, right? So is it for you, what is the balance of inspiration versus craft in songwriting? Um... I don't like my craft. I don't have one. My craft is to just shut up, pick up the, you know, I mean, like you guys witnessed when we were taking a break from your last interview, sometimes I just get a calling and I go sit down at the piano or pick up a guitar. I put on my, get my iPhone, you know, even though I'm in my studio, I put my iPhone in front of there, I push record and I just go Mm -hmm. and something comes and that's my craft. Right. I'm a really great ad libber and I, I improvise you know, my emotions are very free. I'm very, very free emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very, very um, secure about being vulnerable 
and insecure. Like I'm a very confident, vulnerable person. Right. You know, and I'm so used to that discomfort that I, I've actually made it. Uh, I've empowered myself from it, mm -hmm. from the, the the just the the discomforts of you know emotions. Like I've just made it like a power thing. Right. So um, it, that is my my the way I create. That's the way I walk through life. That's the way I talk. Um, everything we're doing right now is ad libbed, right? Mm -hmm. So I figure, why can't we do that on a daily basis with music? Why can we just sit down, pick up a microphone, and not have ever spoken to each other before, and have a perfectly intelligible conversation about a vast, you know, subject matter? Right. Right. We should be able to pick up a guitar and do exactly the same thing. So that's what I do with my artists. I sit them in front of microphones. We put headphones on. I push record in here. And they're like, what are we doing? I'm like, we're going to explore the possibilities now. And then I'll start it off. And they're freaked out because it means you have to say a bunch of stuff that's just going to come out of your mouth. And the brilliant things that kind of come out of our mouth when we have no idea, you can put the greatest songwriters in the world in a room and they'll never come up with that brilliance. Mm -hmm. So it's taking those filters off, right? Yeah. R removing the, the filters so that, that... The uh, editing, taking the editing bay away, taking it all away and just sitting there and just totally being very vulnerable. And, and to me, that's how I like to write. And it's not everybody's way. I'm super fast too, like... You know, I can write a song really, really quick. And I've had sessions where someone's only had an hour and a half with me. I am like like the red laser on someone's forehead. Right. You know, just like, just pinned, zoom in, focused, write a song. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. And good songs. I, I don't write bad songs. I don't, I don't think I've ever written a bad song. Mm -hmm. I feel like all my songs are very well put together now there's some songs that are better than the others there's some songs that people will respond to better but doesn't mean it's a bad song just because you haven't heard it all right so it's not the right place for it or the exactly. right or the right artist so given that you are so technically accomplished and such a great engineer as well does that factor into your writing process do you write the song and hear in your head how things are going to go or no i'm going to put the 47 fed on the kick drum or i'm going to put the 44 over the toms or does that kind of thing impact what you do there is no producing when i'm a songwriter okay there's a few things that happen and one is there is no producing to me until you have a good song there should be no conversation about a kick drum and a microphone mm -hmm. You know, to me, that is a waste of time, and a lot of people do it. Um, that's why we went through this long, I feel like the, the, the phase is coming to an end, where it was all this very overproduced bad songs. That's somebody who didn't write a song, and they're cutting and pasting it and creating it in the box until they develop something and it comes into this, thing and then okay just sing over that you know tracks you know i do believe the day of the tracks are going away yeah and um so i feel like when i'm sitting with somebody i just try to keep focused on the the melody the arrangement the song is this good mm -hmm. do we think this is a good song let's just write it done let's put it away let's go write another one but wait no, we got to write another song to understand if that one was any good or not. So you write another song. This one's better than this song, you know, or whatever. But then until we both, the artist, whatever, decide it's a good song, then I start the production. And then the creative brain clicks on and then I start understanding what the song is asking for. Right, so it's very compartmentalized almost yeah one, one door or open the yeah window i don't between. like cluttering i like simplicity mm -hmm. man i just i like air i like space and so i'm very simple in my productions very organic um but you know i like getting dirty and gritty and you know i have a dirty sound that i like because you know like when something's too beautiful i don't like that i don't right. like clean mm -hmm. you know so i like to 
Right. That's what these guys are for. Sure, and to all this give me my dirt, up, you know, the analog gear. That because you, you know, there's all like the ongoing, like, well, you know, tape is better than Pro Tools. It really depends on what you're doing. Like, to me, I have my my eight channel um, task cam over there. That thing rocks, you know, but I can make that sound good. I can make my four track sound good. It's the ear that makes things sound good. It's not the the device. I mean, the Pro Tools is just a recording device like the tape is. Mm -hmm. I already record a little fatter than normal. So when I go to Pro Tools, it actually is working better for my particular style because sometimes if I overdo it with the tape, it's just fat on top of fat, you know? Right. And so I like the little clarity that the Pro Tools gives because I'm so dirty in mm -hmm. my recordings. Mm -hmm. So there's like a little thing that it does. It's like, oh, I like that. Do you ever go back then once things are recorded and edit the tracks or do you just use Pro Tools as a recorder? No, Pro Tools is a recorder for me. Um, I, Dorothy, for instance, I'll give you a great example of this, how I like to record. So Dorothy, mm -hmm. um, we wrote all the songs first and then we put the band together and we're in a rehearsal room the whole time. And then it's like, okay, let's put a live show together. I wasn't trying to write an album. We were trying to write a live show, hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So we got that, like, okay, we're missing right here. I'm missing, like, uh, maybe we need to drop down a little bit. And the show, I feel like we should do this. Or And now we're going to pick up, you know? And this is where we're going to get the audience kind of involved, right? So we wrote that show. Then we brought the band in, did all the pre-production, brought the band in, set it all up in there. Dorothy was in here live hmm. what all we did was drop some background vocals some tambourine some solos maybe b3 here and there that's my that's why i did the dolly album that's the way i love to record i mean it's so great when you just it all just right right uh. i mean it it mixes when you're on to something and you got it 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 mixes itself that's where I try to strive for. I don't want to be able to, you know, touch this. I want it to just put up and go, oh, my God, this sounds amazing. But in order to do that, you got to move some microphones around. You got I stay away from EQs unless I have to. Mm -hmm. you got to find all the right pieces, the right players, the right drum drums, the right guitar. All those elements have to come into place before we can start the magic. And when that happens and all the characters, because they're like, we're, we're directors, producers, all your characters are in place, you're gonna have a great movie and it's just gonna edit and mix itself. And so that's how I like to do it. And then there's times where Natasha, like I get, um, I did live drums and samples mm -hmm. and then um, like loops and I just tied them together and then I'd go in there and edit. Of course, sure. Sure. Because that's a different that's a different party to right. go to. Right, right. So you you mentioned the mixing process. When you finish them with all the tracking, is it mixed or do you take everything back to zero and start over and say now we're going to actually do the the mix? No, I don't mix. I don't like mixing. Okay. I love you know the that's the part of collaborating that I love. I love you know doing my job. This is my perspective. Yes, had a lot of time with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need somebody else's perspective now to take it to another level. So I love finding the right engineer to to um, mixer to to take in the vision and go, okay, I know where I can take this now because by that time my ears are dead. I don't really want to engage in mixing. It's a whole other art, to be right. honest. I'm a great. I can do really good raw mixes. People love my mixes. In fact. A lot of people actually have favored my raw mixes over people's polished ones. That's where I'm good at. But when for like pop and radio and all that, shit, I don't have a clue. So, but I love that journey. Like you're passing on your material now. You're all this body of work to this, you know, Neil Pogue or Chad Blake or Andrew Sheps. And it's like, okay, now you guys go do your thing. Right. Because they're so great at it. You know, I mean, Andrew amazing i mean he's such a geek i love it and it's like he all went in the box now you know right. and you know he's designing his own geeky little you know apps and um uh plugins and and so but i love his ear and so i want my to sound good so i'm gonna drop my ego 
Because mm-hmm. that's what you need to do. Right. Every producer thinks they're a mixer, and they're not. You know, right. so you just got to realize, I'm, I did my job. I'm a good songwriter. I'm a good producer. Now I'm going to go get someone who's really great at mixing to take my to a whole other level. And then after that, just doesn't stop there. Then you got to find the right mastering person. Sure. Because now that person's either going to make or break your, your, and so you got to really be, you know, understanding who you're getting involved with and making sure the mixers, you know, nowadays the mixers are just like jumping everything over into the red because they want their stuff to sound mastered already. Right. So the, you know, so we're, there, it's like a never ending cycle. So it's just a lot of, you just got to make sure you're going into the right hands with your with each project. Right, right. Yeah, I've I've spoken to many artists about uh, and producers as well about that letting your ego let go of something you're so invested in because mm-hmm. it, it's your your creation, right? And your your art. And so turning that ego off is really can be a challenge. Yeah. Well, sometimes I've had somebody come out and be like, "God, my mix doesn't sound great." And I'll have somebody a friend come in and go and I'll be like, "What did you do?" It's like, "I took that in weird guitar the double you didn't need the stereo acoustic guitar i'm like i loved that guitar but i wouldn't let it go you're right right. right. you know and you do you're just like i can't let it go i can't let that i mean i spent five hours getting that i can't let it go well let it go if it took you and that then that became my new motto if it takes if it takes you five hours to write a song give up man it's not happening Hmm. You know, and if it takes you five hours to record a song, you're doing something severely wrong. You know, so it's like I don't like to take, I don't like to labor. Right. I just like it to just happen. Right. Right. I read a, a quote from you that I, that I thought was very interesting and it actually ties back to what we talked about at, at the beginning. And I'm not, I'm just paraphrasing, but you said basically talent is one thing, but ambition is the thing that's going to give you the success. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of talented people, but they're not ambitious. They're very lazy. Um, They don't have the drive. Uh, So I see that, you know, you can take an artist that maybe you don't think is very talented, but their ambition and their motivation and their drive and their willingness to just just work and work because their passion, they want to be famous. Right. They're going to be famous. That's what they want to do. But they don't have the talent of, say, John Lennon. But John Lennon, he doesn't... I'm just using this as an example. John Lennon wrote this song, Imagine. What a beautiful song. But it's never going to see the light of day because John doesn't want to go out there and go play. John doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't want to, you know, shake hands. He's not motivated. I'll get to it, you know. But the person who has... Uh, toxic is not a great song. It's okay, but oh my God, that girl is, you know, waking up at five o'clock in the morning, learning all her dance routines, is on, you know, and a lifetime diet, uh, you know, knows how to work the audience, knows how to get up on stage and really be charming and work, 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 and try to be better and try to do something different and whatever her looks, everything, putting the whole package together, that girl is going to succeed because she really wants it. Right. So I do believe that the less talented person will succeed over the really talented person because they just have more ambition and drive. That's the key is the ambition and the... Talent is a tiny part of this whole process. We we all see it. I mean, we've all heard it mm-hmm. for the past, you know, 20 years now. I mean, we obviously know talent isn't what's getting people there. Their ambition... Their managers, their team, right. the stars lined up, right. luck, destiny, it all plays a part in it. Mm-hmm. But talent is just one part of this. Right. Right. That's awesome. So we were talking a little bit earlier about something that you're very passionate about, which is bringing kids into the music industry and kind of regrowing that grassroots part of the industry. Tell us why you're so passionate about that. Well, I have a four-year-old son and a 13-year-old, 11-year-old stepdaughter, and both of them show signs of wanting to be in the music business or or liking music. Mm -hmm. Um, And I am getting concerned if there's going to be a music business for them to get involved in. I've seen nothing but the community drop 
lower and lower and lower. And I've seen ants have a higher bar than we do, you know, and good is not good enough anymore. It's just not, it's, it's not acceptable to me. We have to be excellent. We have to be great. We have to aspire to be better than good because good is the new normal. And that's just not okay with me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, it starts with the kids. They have to get the right information. I want them to see this. I want them to see all this beautiful, sexy stuff, you know, (laughs) because I want their little fingers all over this because it's fun. It's powerful. Like you don't have to be the girl with the two top half naked on stage dancing around talking about licky licky, you know, if that's a sign, I like it. Let's write that. Um, (laughs) And, um, you know, you can be the person behind it. You can be writing the songs. You can be producing the songs. You can be engineering the songs. You can be mastering it, mixing it. You can be a CEO. You can be a manager. You can be anything you want. There's a big arena of um, uh, to-dos in the music business. And so that's what I'd like to do is just really give the kids this information and let them know that being a producer is cool, man. It's being, it's cool. Like I get to do so many different things. I get to work with so many different people and I don't, who cares about being in the limelight? Who cares? That's not a powerful, that just because a light is shining on you on a stage or a camera does not mean the light is shining down on you. Right. You know, we create our light. And so that's what I really want to do is get kids in the studio. I do a lot of panels right now. I do a lot of stuff for the Recording Academy, um, for women in music. Um, and I just think it's very important for us to use this platform right now because these kids are the future of music. And if there is no community for these kids to get involved in, music is going to be hashtags and um, uh, 3D experiences and HD and, you know, holograms and, and t- needle drop uh, music from uh, uh, a room full of uh, people that they hire to make music. Right. You understand? It's like, it's just going to be t- for hire. Hey, we need some music for this. Okay. Ta-ta-ta-ta-pat. Drop it, pop it out there. Goodbye, rock stars. Right. Not going to exist unless they're in hologram form, which we all know that's coming. You know Janis Joplin's coming back in a holo, holo, hologram <laughs> right. Right. somewhere. Right. It's going to happen. Right. We're going to see Janis Joplin on the, the Grammys uh, on the stage with Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley singing a song together. Right. It's going to happen. Sure. Something like that, that crazy is going to happen. Sure. Therefore, you know what? They're not going to need the other troublemakers. Right. They're just going to buy the likeness of you and me and That'll we don't enough. have to deal with you guys anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. You're painting our, right. <laughs> this person is going to show up on time and you know what? This person's cheaper. Right. And I don't know mod squad or whatever you call those. What is it called? Makeup squad, none of it. No touring. Right. I mean, can't you see it? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Scary. And we hate to see that. I'd, I'd really rather see what you're talking about with a bunch of fresh people coming in and taking the music forward. We so do. Let's hope so. And but the, what I'm talking about is not old school. It's just, it's old school mentality of like nurturing and developing. But the new school mentality is that you actually have to really work this. You have to find different avenues than the regular DSPs that are out there. And you got to just think outside the box. What what can we do? Oh, I have an idea. How about just make a great album? Right. That's a thought. And I have another idea. How about you be really good when you perform? That's crazy. Right. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> do that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Never even thought about that. Right. And right. actually have a vision. Woo. <laughs> That's that's the new model. Right, right. We all know it's the old model, but I'm going to call it the new it, model. It'll be fresh when it comes yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. So I have one more question yep. for you. When I'm with an artist producer on your level who's worked with so many amazing artists, I have to ask, what is it that makes a great artist? 
I feel like if someone could take little screen grabs of everything I've said, it's all in there. Someone who is not afraid to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Someone who can step into their power that can be ego-less, you know, in the right situations. A great collaborator. Someone who lifts people, not tries to tear them down. That explores the endless possibilities of creativity and is not afraid to just risk it all. Um, and someone who is using their voice to give a voice to others who can't. To me, a great artist is someone who's just so confident and so evolved with who they are that all these little tedious, weird little, I don't know, dramas that come in, you know, like the being late. Really? Do you have to be late? If it's somebody who's just, it just steps in their power and wants to empower you. That to me is just what makes a great human being. And when my, my logic is when I'm winning, everybody's winning because I know when I win, everybody's going to get a piece of that. They're going to have that. They're going to know they're going to win. Right. I don't understand winners who just, who just keep it for themselves. It's like, let's, let's go be winners together because this is what we have to invest in. We have to. Right. We have to invest in this business. If we're all committed to doing this, I mean, your talent, we're all talented in the music business in some form you know, different ways, sure. but we're all trying to s send out the same message. So to me, that's what makes someone great who is helping get the message out. Right. That's awesome. Linda, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking yeah. the time to chat with us and share your wisdom and your, uh, your experience and all this. It's thank you. really been great to talk to you and a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so appreciate much. It. You bet. And thank you for joining me here. We are in Sherman Oaks, California. We're at We Are Here at Linda Perry's studio. And thank you for joining me. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.